Damn, that's some nice femra. Oh my god, could you please knock before coming in? Where have I been and where's the tank guide? Oh, you want to learn how to play tank? Eh, I guess I can put something together. Well, I've been tanking since I Realm Reborn, which means everything I say in this video is right, and if you disagree, then you're just wrong, but feel free to leave those disagreements in the comments below to help my reach. Uh, just to be serious for a moment, this video does actually aim to make you a better tank if you're struggling or want to get into the role, but I think learning should be a bit of fun too, right? Also, yes, I do stream on Twitch, go follow me there, I answer newbie questions, okay, thanks, back to the video. When you hear the word tank, what do you think? I think of a heavily armoured fighting machine carrying big weaponry. And what do you think a heavily armoured machine should be doing? That's right, wanting attention like one of those bad YouTube pranksters, ignoring pain like how your mom ignores me every night, and dealing damage like how red pillars dealt permanent damage to our generation. I call these the three pillars of being a tank, and it is your responsibility to maintain them. Now sit your cute little butt down and let me break that down for your small little head. Before we begin though, let's look at our options. First we have the bitch behind a shield paladin. Very straightforward gameplay wise with an extremely flexible and versatile rotation, a plethora of defensive cooldowns, great sustain and a ton of utility. Has a lot of buttons but don't be intimidated by this, Paladin is super simple. Next we have a baby's first tank, Warrior, and it's really in the name. Warrior is the easiest tank in the game. A rotation that doesn't require a brain, defensives that sustain you and self healing that makes healers unemployed, like me. Then we have the best tank in the game. You know what it is, baby. It's goddamn Dark Knight, and this tank sucks hard and that's why I love it. I mean, what? Dark Knight's rotation is... Oh, Jesus Christ, man. They're all easy as rotations, okay? It's a tank, not a DPS. What did you expect? Anyways, Dark Knight has no sustain, but they do have the best mitigation of all the tanks in most cases, and deal the highest burst damage, which will make your party members with raid buffs very happy. And last but not least is the Zuma Brain Gunbreaker. Play this job if you don't like your wrists and love to panic during every tank buster because you're mid-nashing fan combo and didn't pop defensives in advance. Anyways, the most important decision here is to play what tank you enjoy or find the most appealing, because all tanks are viable. Crazy concept, I know, but they all have their strengths and weaknesses compared to other tanks, except warriors. Warriors have only strengths. F warriors. Anyways, let's start with enmity or aggro or hate, whatever you want to call it. It's as easy as pie. Simply pop your tank stance and viola. Everyone wants a piece of that cake. There are two ways to track enmity, either through the enemy list or party list. From the enemy list, if the enemy's icons are red, well done, you're doing your job. They're into you. If they're orange, they're tempted, but not fully into you just yet. If they're yellow, you're slacking, and if they're green, then what the f*** are you doing? Through the party list, you'll see these bars under everyone's job icon with letters and numbers. If the bar has an A, is full and red, that means you have aggro. If it has a 2 and is orange, that means you're second in aggro. Good if you're an off tank. And then it has any number ranging from 3 to 8. That means you're within that range of aggro, respectively which should never be the case as a tank. A good habit in high-end content is to pop your tank stance even when off tanking after your opener. This way you'll always be second in aggro, which is important because some tank busters target second in aggro rather than tanks. And as funny as it is to watch DPS die to tank busters, they won't be too happy about it. It's also good to be second in aggro just in case the main tank does die, because then the boss will be forced into attacking you rather than an unsuspecting DPS. Tank stances include Iron Will for Paladin, Defiance and Warrior, Grit for Dark Knight, and Royal Guard on Gunbreaker. They all do the same thing, which is increasing your enmity by a ton. While on the subject of enmity, we should talk about this funny thing called a tank swap. Tank swaps are needed in most high-end content, and this can range from a forced tank swap due to a tank buster giving the main tank a vulnerability, which will result in a death if they take another auto attack or another tank buster of the same type. Tank busters are these big hits specifically meant to be taken by tanks and mitigated using your defensive cooldown, so make sure to use them or end up dead, you dingus. You might also tank swap to alternate which tank takes specific busters throughout an encounter, but don't worry too much about this as it's very fight specific and you'll learn that as you go into these fights. Executing tank swaps is is made easy through the usage of provoke, shirk, and having your tank stance active. 
Provoke taunts the target and places you on top of the enmity and it makes it easier to generate additional enmity for a few seconds. Shirk, on the other hand, transfers 25% of your generated enmity to a targeted party member. So tank swaps are as simple as off tank provokes boss, main tank shirks off tank, off tank is the new main tank. Although in the grand scheme of things, you'd still be considered the off tank for position sake or the main tank. Speaking of which, main and off tank are simply roles. The main tank is the tank who will do the majority of tanking the boss, while the off tank will mostly be a really cute emotional support partner providing the main tank with their love and affection. In terms of who should main tank, well, that depends. The best main tanks are warriors and paladins, while the best off tanks are dark knights and gunbreakers. Don't at me, I'm looking at you paladin mains who think paladin is an off tank. You lot honestly make me sick. Anyways, comfortability and gear also play a big factor. Dark Knights can main tank and Paladins can off tank, but they shouldn't. But they can, so don't be turned off by that. Did you know the best offense is a good defense? Or is it the best defense is a good offense? Uh, whatever. Let's talk defensives. Tanks aren't just about holding the nasties aggro. Staying alive is also part of your role description and is just as much as the healer's responsibility as it is yours. Because of this, tanks have access to a plethora of defensive cooldowns and we're going to go deep in this, so buckle up. So, about that love and affection I previously mentioned. Well, these are great on your co-tank for tank busters, but can also be used on yourself and... What do you mean by love and affection? Oh, right. Uh... They are your short cooldowns, which include Paladin's Holy Sheltron for self and intervention for allies, Warrior's Blood Wedding for self and Nascent Flash for allies, Dark Knight's The Blackest Knight and Oblation, which can be used on self and allies, and Gunbreaker's Heart of Corundum and Aurora, which can also be used on self and allies. These abilities all serve a similar purpose, to either support your co-tank, buff yourself, or save someone in a pinch while being on a relatively low cooldown, making them easily accessible to use. All tanks have access to Rampart, Reprisal, and Arm's Length. Rampart is on a 90 second cooldown and reduces damage taken by 20% for 20 seconds and are 2 minute defensives. This includes Paladin's Sentinel, Warrior's Vengeance, Dark Knight's Shadow Wall, and Gunbreaker's Nebula. All of these are identical, reducing damage taken by 30% for 15 seconds, except Warrior's Vengeance, which has the additional effect of delivering a 55 potency attack every time you suffer a physical attack, but only sweaty passes care about that. Either way, you pretty much always want to have a rampart or a two minute defensive plus your short cooldown up for tank busters in raids and trash balls in dungeons. Reprisal reduces damage dealt by 10% to all nearby enemies in a 5 yard radius around you on a 60 second cooldown. This is an absolutely insane ability, so do not sleep on this. It can be great on dungeon pools or tank busters and raid wides and high end content. Its versatility cannot be underestimated. Use this. Oh, and make sure your reprisals don't touch with your co-tank, because that's and I definitely don't like boys. So you'll never catch me doing this. Anyways, please use reprisal every opportunity you can, especially for those nasty hard-hitting raid wides. Your healers will like you a lot. Arms length and nullifies knockback and drawing effects for 6 seconds on a 120 second cooldown. Very nice on knockbacks and a lot of high end encounters have these, so take advantage of it to keep doing what this game revolves around, which is damage. It also has the additional effect of delivering a slow for 15 seconds on enemies that physically attack you, which slows down their cast and auto attacks by 20%. Amazing mitigation in dungeons, but not so much in high-end encounters, because raid encounters are usually immune to this. So use this for mitigation in dungeons and in high-end raids and trials for the anti-knockback. Oh, almost forgot, but tanks also have these things called personals or unique cooldowns. These include Paladin's Bulwark, Warrior's Thrill of Battle, Dark Knight's Dark Mind and Gunbreaker's Camouflage, and if you can't tell by their tooltips, they all do quite different things. Bulwark blocks all incoming damage, and every damage type can be blocked. Thrill of Battle increases the warrior's health and healing received by 20%, again works for every damage type. Meanwhile, Dark Knight's Dark Mind only works for magical damage, so if a boss does do physical attacks and tank busters, it's almost useless. Maybe use it on raid wides or something. And Gunbreaker's Camouflage reduces damage taken by 10% and increases their parry rate by 50%. Parries only work on physical attacks, so on magical attacks the parry rate is completely useless, but at least with Gunbreaker it still has a constellation of mitigating 10% damage. How about we move on to the abilities that make you say no to death? Invulnerabilities. Which include Paladin's Hallowed Ground, Warrior's Home Gang, Dark Knight's Living Dead, and Gunbreaker's Super Belight. For dungeons, popping an invulnerability is usually not a bad idea, especially when leveling and depending on the tank. 
A paladin using a hallowed ground on the first pull, for example, can work well as it has no drawback. Just pop hallowed, 10 seconds of no damage, and it will probably be back for the last pull of the dungeon. And while Super Polider does the same thing, it will lower you to 1 HP, so maybe let your healer know. Meanwhile, Warrior's Home Gang just means you can't die for 10 seconds, but it doesn't actively avoid damage. You could, in theory, let yourself drop really low, Home Gang, and then self heal back up with Thrill of Battle, Equilibrium, and Blood Wedding, but you also need to keep in mind what your healer is doing. They could be absolutely shitting themselves. For the most part, it's probably better to just hold on to Home Gang as a response to not getting healed rather than a planned thing, unless you're really bent on giving your healer a heart attack. Dark Knight's Living Dead is somewhat similar to Home Gang, except it triggers when you die and you have insane self-healing during the Walking Dead duration, so it can be good in dungeon pools when you get low. But just like Home Gang, I wouldn't plan on using it unless you're feeling extra spicy and want to save on some other cooldowns. For raiding, however, invulnerabilities are used slightly differently. Those tank busters and tank swaps we were talking about earlier, well, invulnerabilities can be used to ignore them, which in turn saves on defensive cooldowns for both tanks and resources on healers. They can also just be used on really hard hitting tank busters to help spread out your other defensive cooldowns better throughout an encounter. All right, before we move on, let's compare the difference between using defensives in dungeons to high end encounters, because this is important. For dungeons, which shouldn't take too long to talk about and assuming we do wall-to-wall -wall pulls which i strongly encourage as they speed up your group considerably what's a wall-to-wall -wall pull you might ask it's when we pull until the dungeon walls us off hence the name and as long as you're appropriately geared and you know follow this guide you have no excuse not to wall-to-wall -wall pull Anyways, we'll begin with a sprint outside of combat, which will let us use 20 seconds of sprint rather than the 10 seconds of sprint inside of combat. After that, we should open up our first pull with a rampart and fill in the gaps with our short cooldown, reprisal and arm's length if the pack even lasts that long. For the next pull, we'll open up with our two minute defensive and again fill in the gaps with our short cooldown, reprisal and arm's length if we didn't previously use it. If the pack is still alive by this time, Rampart should be back up, so we'll pop that and we should be good. Typically, the first pull won't require as much because usually everyone has all their buffs up, but the second pull might last a little longer because, well, everyone used their buffs on the first pull. Duh. If, for some reason, the pack persists after running out of all of your defensives and you're really struggling to stay alive, then obviously invulnerability is an option, but if it isn't, then you have this nifty tool called Sprint, which can be used to kite mobs in a small circle. I really don't encourage this unless absolutely necessary because it will mess up the pack's positioning and your party will most likely lose damage because cleaves will miss. So only consider this as a last resort and don't at me if tanks are doing this when they don't need to. Don't worry about defensive during dungeon bosses too much, they hit like little bitches, and the most you'll need is a short cooldown. This way you'll always have your defensives back up for the next wall to wall pulls after boss fights. Now, there isn't really a golden rule on where or when to use a defensive or invulnerability in raid environments, so let me try to explain some scenarios. Most encounters open up with raid wides into tank busters. Sometimes it's best to use an invulnerability through these tank busters because these are the longest cooldown and doing this will put your invun on a cooldown sooner so it'll be back up later into the fight. Sometimes it's best to just use a ramp or a two minute so they're back up sooner and even the decision between using a rampart or the two minute can vary between encounter for example if you were to use rampart first maybe it'll be back up for the next tank buster or if you use your two minute first because the next tank buster is within 80 seconds so if you used rampart it wouldn't be back up but opting in to use your two minute defensive instead will ensure rampart is up for it or maybe there won't be another tank buster in two minutes after the initial one then you can opt into kitchen sink and by the way kitchen sink is a tank and healer term, but basically imagine throwing everything you have into a sink. Well, similar concept here, you're throwing all of your defensives into one instance of damage. An effective technique and thanks to Ender Walker introducing every tank to a short cooldown, needing a rampart or a filler cooldown for auto attacks is mostly a thing of the past. But, and there's always a but, you won't always be able to kitchen sink every tank buster, so keep this in mind. Every tank also has access to an AoE raid mitt. These include Paladin's Divine Veil and Passage of Arms, Warriors Shake It Off, and Dark Knight and Gunbreaker's Dark Missionary in the Heart of Light. Just like with Reprisal, it's important to use these as they have such short cooldowns and offer amazing survivability throughout an encounter. If you're unsure on what to use these on, well, you can never go wrong on using them on boss raid wides to help your entire party out and your healers. But as you get into more high-end raiding, it's a good habit for both tanks to spread out their raid mitts out 
just like with their reprisals, but they do stack so it isn't the end of the world if you do catch yourself doubling up with another tank. Oh, and one last thing before moving on. Limit Break, or LB. In dungeons and such, you won't really catch yourself using this, but tank LB is good and should not be undervalued. LB1 reduces damage taken by 20% for 10 seconds and has a 2 second animation lock, while LB2 mitigates 40% damage for 15 seconds and LB3 mitigates 80% damage for 8 seconds, both of which have 4 second animation locks. Some trials and high end encounters will require a tank LB for certain mechanics, while other times tank LB can just save a run. This is something I can't honestly put into words or explain, it's just something you'll get a feel for over time. But don't worry, nobody really expects you to be a god gamer and save runs with tank LB, but it can be impactful when done right. Got a question for you, what's the most important thing in FF14? Ding ding ding, time's up. That's right, it's damage. You did answer damage, right? Well, as a tank, it's also your responsibility to do exactly that. Most tank rotations are incredibly straightforward and usually involve numbing your brain with 1, 2, 3 for single target and 1, 2 for multiple target, with a few extra buttons here and there and resources to spend. If that's confusing to you, I don't know what to say man. Nah, but for real, there are plenty of resources going into each job individually and I'm not doing that in this video, it's long enough, jeez. Huh? What do you mean I haven't explained much? Oh my lord, look! Just like a melee DPS, you are a tank, but it's also just as important to you as it is to a melee DPS to keep as much uptime as possible. What do the cool kids call this? ABC? Always be casting or some like that? But yeah, keep that GCD rolling or whatever. Anyways, more about this in another section of the video if I don't forget. Anyways, next we have roll actions. Oi, are you falling asleep on me? Come on, I'm not that boring, am I? Anyways, we covered Rampart, Provoke, Shirk, Reprisal, and Arm's Length, which only leaves us with Low Blow and Interject. Oh. Anyways. Low Blow is an OGCD stun on a 25 second cooldown, stunning the target for 5 seconds. It can be useful in dungeons and overworld content, maybe to stun a mob who's doing a point blank AoE, or to just stun a mob in a pool to mitigate damage. But for high end raid and trials, Eh, kinda useless. Interject interrupts the target cast if it can be interrupted, indicated by the cast bar visual. This is good, but SE for God, this ability even exists, so most enemy mechanics just can't be interrupted. Oh well, still good if you do catch one of these abilities. And that will conclude this guy. Huh, I haven't talked about grouping and positioning. <sighs> Fine, but... I'm not going to sugarcoat my words here, because these things are some stuff that I've seen even the most seasoned tanks fail at. Let's begin with one of the first habits you should learn when doing dungeon pulls. Initially when pulling a pack, rather than just pulling the pack and walking over it until you're in front of them, you should move through them. Doing this will group them up better for cleave damage for you and your party, and have them facing away from the party so AoEs are only facing you, which means only you have to dodge the danger and not your party. This also applies to Rage and Charles, and in their cases, usually you want the boss facing north, most of the time for mechanical orientation, unless an encounter demands the boss be faced another way, either by itself or for a mechanic. But just keep in mind to have the default be north and away from the party. When in dungeons, if a pack has a ranged mob or two, there are a few ways to deal with this. If it's just one range mob, once you finish pulling all the other mobs, drag them through the range mob, which in turn will group up all the mobs. Or alternatively, line of sight the range mob, just make sure not to line of sight your healer for too long. But if you're dealing with multiple range mobs, they might be spread out from each other, so your options are line of sight or continue to pull the mobs, which in turn outranges the ranged mobs, and this will eventually group them up together, so you can then proceed to drag the melees into the ranged mobs. <sighs> Speaking of ranged, we should talk about this cool thing known as a ranged attack, because the more tanks I make aware of this, the better. While pulling, I recommend spamming ranged attacks on enemies. This will keep your GCD rolling while moving to the next pack, and keep a steady stream of enmity on all the mobs if you tab between the mobs while ranged attacking. If a DPS does manage to pull aggro, that's fine. They are acting as a form of mitigation. Use their health bar to your advantage. And as a DPS, they will and should pull the mob into AoE once you've finished pulling the mobs. If they don't, let them die. No, I kid. Just provoke the mob and let it come into your AoE. Provoke has a 3 second or so enmity insurance, so even if they continue to attack the mob, it'll only have eyes for you. And by that time, your AoE will hit it and generate a ton of aggro. Also, I bet some of you have seen this, but tanks using their gap closers to pull bosses. Before you think this idea looks cool or is good... Stop. That's bad. No. 
don't do this. It off centers the boss and it's just cringe for everyone. Melees have to run over to the boss, losing precious moments of damage, and casters don't even get a chance to pre-cast their spells. Pull with your ranged attack or provoke. And now we run into another controversial topic, provoke pulling. Now, in my opinion, both work. Provoke pulling is good if you don't want to delay your GCD, and ranged attack pulling is good if you want to pull the boss in a specific way. Provoke pulling is a little bit more on the advanced side, though. If you ever get into a sweaty speedrun group, it's something you might end up doing, and honestly, even I do it in some encounters. But yeah, if an encounter needs stricter positioning at the start, I'll typically pull with a ranged attack so my GCD is at least running and I can focus on positioning the boss. While still on the topic of positioning and using ranged attacks, let's talk about a habit you should incorporate and get good at. I've heard this be called stutter stepping, so that's what we're going to call it. Say you need to move the boss from the center of the arena to the north, just for example's sake. Now, you could just go directly north and start ranged attack spamming. This, in my opinion, is pretty bad low. For one, you're standing there like a dingus tomahawking or some other dumb And the next thing is the boss will rush to you and cause melees to lose their uptime because of the boss's sudden movement. Instead, you'll want to stutter step, which is doing a GCD moving and when your gcd is about to come back up go in for another gcd and continue to drag the boss and repeat this process until you're in the new position this way you won't lose any precious gcds during a boss fight and neither will any of your party members of course if you're in a rush or late to positioning opting in to head directly to a spot and range attacking is fine i guess successfully doing your job as a tank is the most important thing here sadly in endwalker positioning isn't really a thing because most bosses just recenter themselves in the middle of the arena for mechanics anyways but some bosses still do require precise positioning so don't completely disregard this information wow just look at you you're positively brimming with knowledge and i bet you're ready to take on any tanking challenge this game throws at you now go and make me proud but wait before you leave scroll down just a little bit and you see that button subscribe ah uh, yeah you saw it light up yeah well click it also, the like button. Oh, you saw that light up too, right? Click it. Also, follow me on Twitch so I can game as my job. I stream a lot. And if you like this type of content, that takes a lot of work. Consider supporting me on Patreon so I can continue to release videos like this. Thank you, Patreons. Did I forget to mention anything important to tanking? Let me know in the comments and make sure to tell me I'm a bad tank mentor because I forgot your little niche tanking tip. Anyways, have a nice day and goodbye.